Subscribe and comment on the video in the card above for a chance to win a $20 Amazon gift card at the end of the month. Beware the full moon. This world is a strange one. My favorite monsters are back and ready to hunt. Tonight, I have for you some allegedly real stories of vicious werewolves. There are so many sightings of this same creature throughout the globe that people must be seeing something. But what is it? Is it the werewolf from Hollywood films or simply some unknown creature with an insatiable appetite? Whatever it might be, the next time you're out and about, you might ask yourself, when will you encounter this fearsome beast? Before we start, I'm still looking for some longer Craigslist stories if anyone has them. Besides that, I would love to hear more McDonald's stories and Walmart stories as well. Send over any scary stories you might have at darknessprevails.org. Now, let's see what it's like to be eaten alive. Number one, my encounters with werewolves. Submitted by Cheyenne H. I've seen two of them in my life. Things I believe were werewolves. The first when I was around the age of 14 and the other not too long ago. I live in the southern part of Kansas, so there's mostly just countryside where these sightings took place. As for my first encounter, I lived out in the countryside of Kingman County, where my closest neighbor was around a mile away. My parents would let me take nighttime walks during the summer, which was when this happened, the summer of 2012. I was on one of my routine walks down to the paved road about a mile and a half away, then I would walk back. On the way down south to the paved road, there was a group of trees that always kind of scared the childish part of me. It was so dark and you could always hear animals in there. Well, I would always jog past that part at night, then go along my way to the end of the dirt road. I remember running past this patch of trees, almost freezing when I heard what sounded like coyotes, and that's when I saw what I honestly thought was one of the nearby farmers doubled over in his field. It wasn't unusual for farmers to be out working at night. It was cooler than the day, that's for sure so I slowed down to look over to see if he was all right. This figure, crouched down in the middle of a wheat field to my left, almost seemed to sense that I was watching it. I know this because it looked up directly at me, and I felt my heart start hammering in my chest, while these horrible, malevolent eyes began to glare at me. My body was screaming to run, just run the heck out of there and scream for help, but I couldn't move. You know how in the movies they always say how it feels, like you get frozen into ice and you couldn't do anything but watch? That's not exactly what it was like. You see, it wouldn't know I was scared. I remember the thing stood and it towered over me at about six or seven feet tall. I mean, the field it stood in was at least three feet higher than the road, so I couldn't exactly tell what the height was for sure. I just couldn't take my eyes away from it as I knew my impending death was sure to come. I just knew that they would find my body torn to shreds in the middle of this road, and that would be the end of Cheyenne as the world would know it. I've never been so scared. This werewolf took a couple of steps toward me, sniffing the warm breeze blowing from the south. Its eyes, a sickly yellow, still watched me standing there. It took another step before seeming to change its mind and it got back on all fours and trotted to the patch of trees. I waited, petrified, my legs still screaming to run, while my brain told me to wait, told me it was a trap. So I waited, standing as still as possible, while my eyes scanned the trees in the field ahead. Minutes went by before my phone went off with a text message. I knew I was screwed if it was still there, so I took out my phone anyway and looked at the message. When are you going to be back? I need help with laundry. I couldn't believe it. I had just survived meeting a werewolf, and now I was going back to do laundry when I got home. I turned and began the too long walk back home, about a mile and a quarter, when I met the grove of trees I sprinted past, hoping that that creature wasn't still in there, watching me. Needless to say, 
I got home safe to help my mom with laundry. I never told her about my encounter because I knew she would think I was a complete nut job. Now on to my second encounter. It took place on January 29th of 2017, around three in the morning. I live in Harper County, Kansas with my husband. We were hanging out with his brother that night, playing Dungeons and Dragons. I know, yes, we're dorks, but it's our version of family fun. Well, around 2 a.m., I got cravings for ice cream, so we went to the next town over to Casey's to get some. The drive there was nice, with us singing along to music in the car. We ate our ice cream at the general store before heading back home. This time, instead of taking the highway, we went down the dirt roads. We went down one of the roads, 20th Avenue, for about one mile before I got this sick feeling in my stomach, like we were being followed. I knew there weren't any vehicles around because there were no lights at all, not even tail lights or brake lights, nothing. There was nobody around. So I turned and I started heading west for about a mile, but I still felt like there was something almost hunting us. So I turned heading back south towards town on a dirt road that many people in our county call Whiskey Road. A lot of people believe that that road is cursed or haunted because of how many wrecks there are on that road and how many people have died there. Well, I figured since it goes straight to town, it would be our best bet. So we're going south for about half a mile when I asked my husband, are the car doors locked? Now, with our car, the doors don't always lock when you press the lock button. The only way to be sure is to try to open the doors. I don't know, he replies. Do you want to stop and check? I'll open the doors and close them again to be sure. I shook my head, looking in the rear view mirror as I pressed the lock button a few times. I see that my husband's brother, who's 13 years old, is passed out in the back seat. What's wrong? My husband asks. I feel like we're being followed. I answer quietly. I don't want to wake his brother up and scare him, but not by a person. More like something supernatural, he says. Now you should know that my husband and I are Wiccans. We do believe in magic and spirits and supernatural beings. Though together we haven't seen much, we tend to keep that hidden because many people in our town would kind of go on a witch hunt if they knew. So it wasn't unusual for us to have a conversation like this. Yeah, I answered, before tapping the brake to go over a bump in the intersection. I could see now, in the taillights, that there was something behind us in the dust. I couldn't quite make it out, but I knew what it was. I knew, from that moment almost five years ago, exactly what I was looking at. I had told my husband a few times before of my encounter with the above-mentioned werewolf. I told him how it felt, how it was real, how big it was and how terrified I had been. My husband was looking at me, curious as to what I was seeing. Werewolf, I whispered, tapping the brakes again to see if I can make it out any better. I could feel that it had moved. You know when sometimes you feel like you're being watched, you can feel what direction it's coming from. I felt exactly like that. I could feel where it was following us from, to the back of the vehicle, near the driver's side, my side. I could not see it in the taillights, so I kept going, speeding up. I was terrified, knowing that the road was dangerous because of how many wrecks happened, but knowing that if that thing caught us, it could be much, much worse. At the next intersection, I tapped the brakes again, making sure to check both ways for any other cars. I looked in the rear view mirror, and I saw it again, but only its back haunches. The legs were human-like, but the ankles and feet resembled that of a wolf or dog. The thing had knees and thighs and shins, but from the ankle on, it was all wolf. It was trying to hide in the dust, trying not to be seen, like a predator trying to get closer. My husband was worried, asking what we're going to do. I did not answer. I was too busy watching out the mirror and trying to watch the road at the same time. Can you, can you see it? He asks, he sounds scared. It was behind us, I answer. We drive a little bit more and I could feel it was back on my side of the car, but still a little bit behind. I was going around 40 to 45 miles per hour so the fact that it was keeping up 
sent shivers down my spine. My head was pounding from all the pressure inside. With every brief glimpse that told me where it was, the fear inside me grew and was causing too much pressure to build up. I wanted to know more, to see exactly what it was doing and to be sure of what it was. Like knowing a serial killer is in your house, but not knowing exactly where. I almost want to press the brakes to see if I can see it again, I whispered, eyes roaming both fields. But I don't want it to catch up to us. Don't, my husband said, head whipping back and forth, trying to catch a glimpse of this creature. I'll have to at the intersection so we don't flip, I said. I put pressure on the brake, eyes back on the mirror, and then I saw it. Front paws, more like hands with claws, to be honest, in the tall grass on the side of the road, while the rest of its body stretched across the dirt road. Its head was turned toward us, eyes piercing like I remembered the other ones being. It was massive, even as it stood on all fours. It had to be at least eight feet tall, the way it stretched across the road like that, from one side to another. My husband only saw its haunches at that time, but later, the next time our lights went on, he saw its arms. Its front arms were huge, almost gorilla-like, with those bulky muscles that stood out on them. He says he saw its face at one point. It was almost human-like, if that's what you want to call it. It had the muzzle of a dog, but the eyes were definitely human. It had ears like a wolf, but they were laid back, like when a dog is angry. He believes now that those things were definitely out for blood. The way he saw its mouth open, but couldn't see its teeth. I wish I could say the same. Its teeth were huge. I saw it, even in the short glimpse I caught. We started to see the lights from town, and I sped up. I was going 50 now, and this thing was keeping up. I felt my blood pumping through my veins heatedly too fast. I felt like I was either going to wreck or get eaten alive. I looked in the rearview mirror again, and I saw my husband's brother still asleep through all of this terror. I couldn't let this thing get him. He was just a kid. So I kept driving, going 50 on a dangerous road, a road that everyone in the county would swear up and down was cursed. At the next intersection, I couldn't see it, but something told me it was on my side. Then it circled back and was on the other side. At one point, my husband and I both swore that it pulled back, almost like it stopped, before starting back up on the passenger side. Wherever it was, we could always feel it, this primal instinctual fear, a sense of location and doom that I'm sure all prey feel before they die. The edge of town grew closer and I explained my plan to my husband. I'm not going straight home, okay? Why? If it's going to follow us, I want to try to throw it off our trail before we go home. Yeah, I don't want it following us there. What if it ate the cats? Well, it's not the cats that I'm worried about, I deadpanned. I'm talking best case scenario, he answers. The chills from fear seem to gloss back over me. We got to the very northern edge of town and the creature seemed to be pulling back, but it was still coming. It definitely didn't like the light, that's for sure. Eventually, about three blocks before Main Street, I couldn't see it anymore, let alone feel it. The beast was finally gone. Still, I told my husband, I'm almost afraid to leave the car when we get home. We locked up the house before we left. I'll go ahead and wake up Gunner, he said. That's his brother. My husband reached the back seat and shook him awake. Hey, when I tell you to get out of the car, I want you to run to the house, okay? Uh, okay, Gunner said, his voice groggy with sleep, and he was obviously confused. I told my husband, give him the house key, He's the fastest. He'll be able to open the door the fastest. We parked the car in the driveway. Then we all got up and ran to the house. But I was wrong. It was a nightmare how long it took Gunner to open the door. My husband and I stood with our backs to him, watching for that beast to show up. I had my car keys ready like a knife, and I finally heard the sweet sound of the lock of the door click before we walked inside. It took the whole night for us to calm down, and I really thought we were going to die out there, either from that beast or the road. 
I'm just glad that we lost track of it, and I hope we don't come across it again. I probably won't be going down dirt roads at night again anytime soon. Number two, Arabian Werewolf, submitted by iGhost343. This story took place in the winter of 2015, just outside of Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I had been prepping for some off-road adventures with my 4x4 to the wadis of Saudi Arabia, just outside the capital of Riyadh with three friends. Now, many of you are already imagining things like oil, hot sand, riches, and Lambos, blazing sun, or even some other notoriety. But in reality, it's not like that at all. To begin with, most of Western media info regarding the Arab world is false. Believe me, I would be long gone if how they described it was true. Now, on to the story. I was off to the valley, or wadi, which lies outside of the city at the base of the plateau. We reached our destination by afternoon. We parked our car at least 20 meters away from the smooth and unstable edges, and we set up a picnic. The area there is flowery, flat, and rocky on one side, but deep, fear-inducingly high, and crappy on the other. The sun was absolutely blazing that day, but the humid winter winds cooled the land down. There were even heavy rain clouds that signaled future showers. A desert in winter is an unbelievable sight of fresh greenery and massive but short-lived lakes. After we ate lunch and had some desert fun, it was photography time. By now, afternoon had passed and evening was approaching. I told my friends that I'll catch a few more snapshots for another hour, which they agreed to. One of the girls, let's call her Eliza, joined me, bringing our Canon camera along. Down by the water, I snapped the scenery, the birds, or even the occasional fox. It was a good change of pace as I was tired of capturing people in my pictures. Eliza, who I was personally close to, randomly captured me in a shot. I can't blame her happy personality. And just as I shrugged her off, she held my hand and stared me down, her eyes reflecting in the bright sun. She pushed up her sunglasses and my paint mask and we had a bit of privacy. We walked back up the valley together and that's when trouble struck. Something blocked the rocky path. It seemed to be some pale creature. Its limbs were long and hairless and bony. Its head was a long snout and tall ears with a stature of three feet at the shoulders. As I got a better look at it, I could see glossy gray hair running halfway across its spine and its eyes were very much human with whites and clear blue pupils. It glared at us, a dead fox hanging from its salivating mouth. A mangy wolf? It seemed a bit bigger than that. A striped hyena? Too bizarre around here, but trying to be rational, I stuck with that. We were lost on what to do. Eliza hid behind me as I tried to scare it away by putting my backpack on my head, strapping up the mask and breathing loudly and deeply. But no, it did something that burns my mind and thoughts. The thing stood up on its hind legs, like on stilts, like a hunched man on stilts at eight or seven feet tall. The creature snarled at us and my morale just dived to near zero. It took two massive steps forward, ignoring my threats and gestures. Elisa screamed, startling it and giving us a chance. Being the crazy guy that I am, I unfolded my tripod and lunged at the thing, staggering it backwards. This thing was aggressive and we had no other choice. It was us or it. Then a bullet whizzed at the sky. The beast barked at me. Then it sprinted down the valley at inhuman, unnatural speed. It was a horrific sight. Then a local man stood on top of the path with a rifle in his hand. He led us to our car, watched over us, then told us all one thing, leave and don't come back. And we did. After seeing something like that, we listened. We drove off as fast as we could, with the man escorting us with his dogs and pickup truck. The whole thing was just bizarre and a bit life-changing. I've never seen anything like it in my life. You're free to doubt me, and I do too sometimes, but this just proves that there are more mysteries out there. An experience like this is one that I'll never forget, something that will stick in my nightmares. But honestly, someday, Beast, someday, I hope I see it again. 
Number three, Werewolf at the Train Station. Submitted by Werewolf Engine Driver. Before I tell you my story, I will tell you some background about myself. I'm not from the USA, as you might think. I'm from Europe, from the Netherlands to be more precise. Normally, I don't believe in such things as werewolves or ghosts, which isn't odd for a Dutchman. The Dutch are hard to convince of supernatural or mythical stuff like this. As for me, I love nature. I love photography, drawing, and writing. When the first snow had fallen here during the first week of January, I went to the woods near my house to take photos of the beautiful white landscape. I rode to the forest on my mountain bike. At the time, the sun would be setting in about half an hour, so I had to take my photos quickly. Here, you're not allowed to be in the woods after sunset or before dawn, and you're not allowed to camp on the property. Each and every night, the gates close at the same time, right after sunset. When I arrived, I chained my bike to a tree and went on, walking and taking photos. All went just as planned, except I took a bit too long and did not get out in time. The sun was already out of the sky when I came back, and the forest slowly started to come to life. I saw a deer, a fox, but then I saw something else, something dark and big, and when I looked closer, I thought it was a wolf or a wild dog. It had bright yellow eyes and two sharp white fangs sticking out from under the upper lip. I saw the head from profile, but its body was almost frontal view. It was then that I could tell this was no wolf because it had the torso and the arms of a person and the back legs, tail and fur, of course, of a wolf. It looked like it was listening or looking for something. My heart seemed to stop and I froze in place, completely and utterly petrified. This large creature stood not much more than 30 meters from me and I hesitated whether to take a picture or just to run away. But if I took a photo, it'd be a once in a lifetime thing. So I chose that. But the moment I raised the camera, the beast moved its ears, indicating that it had heard me. Then it turned its head right toward me. At that moment, my whole body wanted to give out. I thought I was going to die. For the first time in my life, I felt real palpable dread. Its gaze met mine. That intense look, the creature stared right into my soul. At least, that's what it felt like. When it came closer to me, slowly and almost curiously, as if it had never seen a person before, there was no aggression, though that's what I had expected. Just curiosity. I was still frozen, and I could not move a muscle. The beast now stood less than 10 feet away from me, with no snarl on its face. It sniffed the air, probably smelling my scent. I hoped whatever it was didn't suddenly change its mood and would attack me because I would definitely be finished then. By now, there was hardly any space between us, but the beast did nothing. And as quickly as I could blink, this creature jumped right at me, letting out a short and soft growl, almost like a threat, but oddly enough, it didn't bear its teeth. I took a step back and it took a step forward. By now I knew if it wasn't going to kill me, it wanted me out of the woods. So I continued to walk back, facing it, until what felt like an eternity later, it finally turned around and ran away back into the now dark depths of the forest. I fell to the ground, knees hitting the dirt. I realized what I had just seen, a werewolf, to put it bluntly, and to think, if that creature had just been a little bit more hungry, I would have been dead. I stood up and ran back to my bike and unlocked it as fast as I could before that thing changed its mind. I raced back home and I looked through all the pictures I took, hoping that I caught a glimpse of the creature by accident on different pictures, but there was nothing there. So instead, while it was fresh in my mind, I decided to draw what I saw. And ever since then, I haven't been back and I haven't told anyone else this story. I don't think anyone would believe me anyway, especially none of my skeptic Dutch family. All in all though, despite knowing that that thing does not want me there, I want to go back and I plan on heading back there soon. Number four, 
stalked by a werewolf while on drugs, submitted by Joshua. I live in Birmingham, England, and I'm 15 years old. I belong to a group of friends whose favorite ways to pass the time are with hard drugs and other illegal activities. We're all pretty much train wrecks, to be honest. I've always been skeptical about the existence of creatures such as the ones I witnessed later in the story, but this experience has certainly changed the way I look at the world we live in. This story took place about two weeks ago at the time of writing. Me and six other friends of mine were going to our friend's house. It would be eight of us in total. Her parents and siblings were not home. So as you can imagine, our entertainment for the evening came in the form of two grams of Amsterdam's finest and a few little bags of pretty and colorful pills. We had over 100 pounds, not the measurement, or $120 worth of MDMA, which we would use to throw our lives further into the deep abyss of substance abuse. But enough about our crappy life choices, and don't do drugs, kids. Four of us, myself included, had already smoked some of the weed earlier that day, and the other half of us had taken some of the ecstasy earlier that day as well. After a few hours had passed, we all had come down from our respective highs, and so the six of my friends indoors decided to redose, all taking a whole pill of ecstasy. Me and one of my female friends, we'll call her Jade, were outside having a smoke and deep personal conversation. It's important to mention that, as we wouldn't be going back inside for another half hour after everyone else. Now, for those unfamiliar with MDMA, it takes about an hour to fully kick in, the next 30 minutes go by uneventfully until I received a call from my mother, who was hysterical about my sister, who ironically, had taken some kind of drug, which had my mom freaking out and wanted me to come help to calm her down soon. I obviously wasn't going to ignore the call. Even though I would be really high by the time I got home, I decided to bite the bullet and just go. God forbid anything happened to my sister. It's now 12 at night and in the middle of winter, so it's pitch black outside and I'm making my way back from my friend's house when I encounter a problem. This was the first time I'd ever been to this particular friend's house and we arrived during the day. It was now in the middle of the night and the roads are poorly lit and I come to realize that every one of them I encounter looks almost identical. And that's great because now I'm freaking lost. Paranoia starts to kick in as every small insignificant sound I hear freaks me out. I'm not a big dude, maybe 5'8", and I'm not in any way muscular, so I feel incredibly vulnerable as I poorly navigate the dark, cold, and eerily empty streets, praying I don't encounter anyone with ill intentions. But what I saw next was way worse than anything I could have possibly imagined I would see in my life. Standing on the opposite side of the street in a small alleyway that separated two houses, stood a tall silhouette of a creature engulfed in darkness. All I could see were two beady eyes staring at me under the cover of the shadows. Based on its silhouette, it must have been at least seven and a half feet tall. It had an intimidatingly wide chest with long arms that appeared to be both muscular and scrawny at the same time. Legs that were small in proportion to its enlarged torso, but they were in no way small for a humanoid figure. All of these details I could vaguely distinguish from the darkness as we both stood there, frozen in motion and staring directly at one another. It might have just been 10 seconds, but it felt like forever. This continued until it slowly took a step out of the shade, closer to the glow of a nearby street lamp, and as it revealed itself, my heart sank in my chest. Staring back at me was a man-like beast with close resemblance to a wolf or what I could only think of at the time, a werewolf. Its entire body was covered in thick black hair, its face extended forward to form a long appendage like that of a dog's jaw, and those arms were now in full view, revealing human-like hands with long claws at the end. The thing's face looked only confused or curious at first, which gave me a very small sense of security Although I was still terrified, to say the least, I slowly stepped backwards, maintaining eye contact with this creature as its head slowly followed me as I moved. It just stood there, motionless, 
with the same expression as it watched me walk in reverse without watching where I was going. Because of this and the fear I felt, I fell backwards into a fence, causing a loud banging sound. At that very moment, I knew I screwed up. I watched this animal's demeanor suddenly change from harmless curiosity to complete and utter rage as its eyebrows raised, its head tilted further down to better face me, and its lips reared back in the form of a snarl, revealing a row of long, yellow teeth. It released a quiet growl and took one slow step towards me, like it was taunting me, letting me know that it had all the time in the world because it could catch me anytime, anywhere, in a heartbeat. My obvious reaction is to get the heck out of there. I had been away from my friend's house for about 10 minutes, probably going in circles, so I knew I couldn't be far, and that became my destination. I legged it back the way I came, trying my hardest to retrace my steps, frequently looking behind me to see if that thing was following me. To no surprise, I saw it every time, matching my speed while keeping a careful distance as if to mock me or to torture me with more fear before killing me, just because it could. Luckily for me though, MDMA just so happens to give users an increase in energy. I'm glad that this animal was overconfident enough to let me outrun it for a while as I reached a familiar sight. I now finally recognized the street I was on and from there, I was a mere 30 seconds away from the house. I made as many turns as I could until I reached my friend's street where I was sheer meters away from her house. Before entering, I turned around to ensure that the creature was not in sight. It wasn't because I had just turned a corner, but I could hear its loud footsteps closing in on me. So I quickly bolted inside the house. I shut that door as quickly and quietly as humanly possible and almost broke down on the spot. I now faced my next big problem. Everyone was off their rockers. The drugs had kicked in for everyone else and would soon kick in for me too. It had been about 15 minutes since I left, meaning they would certainly be kicking in within the next 10 minutes and I too would be going nuts. A million different things raced through my head in 10 seconds. I stood with my back against the door, catching my breath until I was brought back to reality by the sound of my friend's laughter in the living room and the alarming realization that the door was unlocked when I came in, prompting me to remember that the keys were lost earlier in the evening. My first course of action is to round up all of my friends and get them out of sight. I dart into the living room and I tried my best to convince everyone to go upstairs. It was the most frustrating minute of my life. Finally, they agreed. I was visibly panicked and Jade, the girl who took her pill at the same time as me, approached me to ask what's wrong. I told her to just wait upstairs, but she doesn't stop asking, so I'm trying my hardest to ignore her while I shut all the windows, curtains, and doors, and I turn off all the lights. I tried my hardest to barricade the unlocked door, but at this point, the ecstasy had kicked in, which makes everything harder to do. Eventually, I stumble up the stairs, and I keep everyone in the dark about the whole thing. Everyone's conveniently too high to care at this point. Soon, Jade succumbs to the drugs as well. I try to remain as sober as I can, constantly peeking out the window, but I see nothing. Eventually, I also concede to the drugs, and everything from that point is mostly broken memories. After that, all I remember is waking up at nine in the morning where my friend's parents had returned home, finding her and her friends all passed out all over the house, vomit on the carpet, cigarettes, lighters, you name it, in various locations around the house. We were all well and truly screwed. Memories of those events all began to return to me on my walk home when I passed the very location I had discovered the thing from the night before. I don't know if it was real, a hallucination or a dream, but I never spoke a word of it to anybody until now. I haven't seen or heard of any similar sightings or strange occurrences in the area, but one thing I'm sure of is that I hope I never see that thing again. Werewolves are sighted on an almost daily basis, it seems. Even without solid proof, it's almost a good bet to say that there is some sort of monster lurking in the woods. A monster looking for its next meal, 
maybe it will get desperate enough to wonder how thin your front door is and to see what kind of food lurks inside. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And don't forget to send us your Craigslist stories, Walmart stories, and even McDonald's stories soon at darknessprevails.org. Thanks.